Thank you for joining the Hybrid Remote Center of Excellence. I'm Noel Simon. I'm your host, and this is the podcast that formerly used to be known as the Janus Oasis. Today, I'd like to actually talk about hybrid work. And somebody posted something today, and I realized that I don't actually have an episode that specifically talks about hybrid work itself. And I thought that was a lost opportunity because I'm creating a hybrid remote center of excellence. So I'm going to do one about hybrid and one episode about remote because they are very different, although remote can really inform hybrid. So that's something important to consider. Now, just so you have my background, in case you don't happen to know me, I've worked some version of hybrid or remote since 2012. I started advocating for it in 2011 because I had small kids and an extensive commute, and I really had the choice of choosing between my work and being available to my kids. And that wasn't an okay choice for me. I wanted to be able to do both. (laughs) And going hybrid was the option that was on the table. Some of the company had already converted to working differently. And I advocated to bring it to our department. And I ended up on a pilot in 2012. So what that actually looked like back then, we had very limited technology. It was dicey whether we could even connect to VPN and actually get our systems to work. And so we started with one day and about a month into our pilot, I broke my foot and it was my right foot, which meant that it was very dangerous for me to drive. And so my choice was either to go on leave until my foot healed or convince them that I could work from home. So I ended up a month into a one-day pilot being five days a week. And so what this meant was I became the guinea pig. I became the tech expert. I became the person who tested everything out. I was the person who was the first to know if a policy or procedure wasn't working, if the technology was failing, if there were challenges in terms of the interactions, how people were understanding or or not supporting me. I was like the canary in the coal mine. And so it helped me develop an expertise to really stand up and say, hi, this isn't working, but this is. Let's do more of this. And I was involved in a lot of the documentation. And eventually our pilot was pulled because we just didn't have the technology to support it. And then we got it back in 2014. And in 2014, I actually went through our team and trained 60,000 or 60 people on how to actually present webinars and connect remotely and adding a video component in terms of how we actually present it. And then we actually accelerated from there. We gradually ended up doing four days a week. We only had one mandatory day that we had to be in the office. And that took me until 2019. And I actually left and went to 100% remote because I'd had a bad car accident in 2018 and I actually didn't want to drive at all anymore. I didn't want to have to commute two hours because although I never moved, my commute with traffic grew to two hours each way. And so even one day a week in the office was too much. It was just intense how much time that one day actually took to complete. And so I actually ended up wanting to move to 100% remote work so that I could choose when and how I actually worked. And so I went from a job where I was actually working 14-hour days to a sales role, which was actually based where I live. So there was some driving because I actually had to go and visit people in person before the pandemic started in 2019. And it meant that I could work a different way. I could choose when I drove. I could choose to schedule all my in-person meetings between two days. Mondays and Fridays, I really worked remotely at home doing reading, writing, research. And I did client meetings. I would do remote meetings on Tuesday and then I would do in-person Wednesday, Thursday, right? So I had the complete autonomy to design my day. But it was interesting because sales has a very much an in-person feel to it. There was a whole mantra when I started in the sales role that if it didn't happen in person, it didn't happen. If you made a phone call, it didn't count because you didn't actually meet that person face-to-face. So that was a very interesting transition in 2020 because all of a sudden that mantra 
had to be thrown out of the window and sales hell had to be done remote. So it was very handy because I had that webinar experience. I could step up and actually do that for myself. But I also had social media background as well, too. So I was reaching out to people on social media. I was writing content for social media. I was the first person to actually publish a blog about the product that actually ended up on the company website. I worked in very different ways because I had a different level of digital literacy and an understanding of how to be visible in a hybrid world that a lot of people didn't show up. And then, of course, my role was restructured. So there's that. But that's my background in terms of hybrid. But what I'd really like to talk to you about is the fact that hybrid, as it existed pre-pandemic, is not what we need to go back to. It's not really about how do we bolter on as an extra. It's more about how do we design in a way that's actually going to benefit employee well-being, engagement, help people thrive, make the business um, succeed, and really have an overall positive impact for the, for the future of work. And really just moving everything onto Zoom, which is what happened with the pandemic, you're essentially taking office-centric practices and policies and procedures and moving it onto Zoom. And that's where we're getting high level of burnout because it just moved to meetings all the time. So it's really difficult to get anything done when you're constantly in meetings. So you have to actually look at the work. How does hybrid fuel the work? The majority of your staff really are going to be individual contributors. So you have to look at how does the work that they do how is it beneficial that they work at home or from a third location that's not necessarily the office? And how do they work when they're actually together as a team? So what is teamwork for their particular job? How does that fuel the results? How does the outcomes that the team produces, how does that output really tie to overall business results? And if you're looking at that Unless you're actually producing something physical where people actually have to hold pieces together physically or they're a design crew and there's a high level of collaboration because they're drawing and actually producing something physical. And there, there are probably millions of other examples, but a lot of times the team aspect of it is more a function of belonging and engagement. So why do you have a team meeting? It's to share information. But if you're really only communicating information, for one, that information should probably be written down if it's useful information to be known. And two, it's not the most effective, it's not the most effective way to communicate information because you're not going to remember something that's spoken. So what's the purpose of your team meeting? Is it to build culture? Is it to build knowledge? Is it to teach skills? All of those can be done remotely. So that's where you have to consider if you're looking at a hybrid function, it's not the simplest option, right? It's not going back to 2019. It's not, let's make everything what it was. You're really looking at the harder option because you're actually fighting the norms that surround that. You're fighting the older mindset. You're fighting bias. Proximity bias is something that people talk about a lot with hybrid, right? So people who are in the office that the managers see all the time, they can interact, they can stop by their desk. That's proximity bias because that person is going to be top of mind because they really just spoke to them. There's a recency bias there as well because they recently interacted with them in, in person. And you're going to think of them just because they happen to be visible within your line of sight, right? Or you run a into them at the proverbial water cooler. So proximity bias is definitely a thing, but there are other ways of fighting that other than just bringing everybody back into the office and really motivating people with this fear of missing out. So you really want to motivate people with fear, and is that the best way to motivate people? I'd argue not. The best way to motivate people is how can you tap into their intrinsic needs and wants? So what is their purpose? How do you give them autonomy and help them gain mastery, right? Those are the elements of intrinsic motivation, right? It's not fear at all. So with hybrid, 
you're fighting bias and you're fighting mindset of the way things used to be, it's the harder option. With remote, the majority of people haven't necessarily worked 100% remote. You're coming to it with a beginner mindset, which is not something that happens in hybrid, right? So hybrid is actually the harder choice. Now, in terms of my view of what hybrid could be, my view is we should really build hybrid with the office as the last consideration. We look, need to look at intention. So what is it you intend to do? Why do you want people to actually congregate in person? How often? It doesn't have to be three days a week, by the way. That's really just what the statistics are showing. If you're looking at economists who studied work from home and, and they're looking at that data, a lot of times the data is showing that people are working in the office three days a week. That's just reflective of what's being. It isn't necessarily what you have to choose. People are choosing that because they are limiting themselves to what the data shows. So I'd encourage you to step away from the spreadsheets and imagine what it is you want. What would you love? What would you love the story of working at your company to be? Do you want the story to be, we're bringing people back into the office for three days a week because that's what everybody else is doing? Or do you want the story to be, we've chosen one day a week for events and to maximize how people interact and to really leverage what makes being in person the best experience we possibly can. And we want to be at the forefront of leadership thinking because we're intentionally choosing something that other people aren't doing. What is it you want to actually accomplish with bringing people back in person? How often? It doesn't have to be weekly. It could be twice a month. You could make those two days a month into events. Think about the office more as a venue, as a tool, as a container for what it is you really want to achieve The office is really about witnessing. So I once actually wrote a post on LinkedIn and I asked people to share with me what they remembered most. What were the most vivid memories they had about being in the office? And the vivid memories that they talked about were getting up in front of a room to receive an award and being recognized and rewarded for work that they had done and they felt seen and they felt valued. So the benefit is witnessing. It feels different to get up in front of the room if you're physically present because people are looking at you, they're seeing you, you can judge their body language, you can judge their authenticity, you can look at what they're wearing, how they present themselves physically, you know, how they stand. All of that really influences what we understand of people, right? So there's a reality to physical presence that could be important, but does it need to be weekly? So again, this comes back to what are you trying to do by meeting in person? Is it creating that sense of belonging? Is it creating that sense of engagement? And how do you do that in a really intentional way? And how do you tell the story about how hybrid is fueling well-being? and how it's fueling the bottom line. So that's really where you really have to become clear on how that all works before you even get into the processes and procedures and tweaking and testing, and then finally embedding the whole thing into your systems. In my view, hybrid is also about how do you empower people to work well? So there's been several studies that have come out. It's not just the location that's important to people, in fact, time flexibility, being able to choose when you work is just as, if not more important than the time, the, fle the, the location flexibility. So that's something to consider as well, too. The job that I had, I was required to be there from 10 to 6. I worked there for 16 years and I couldn't change that time. It was awkward because... Like I couldn't necessarily, a lot of times I would make sure that I could get in by 1030 just based on my commute when I had to drop my kids off and all of that stuff. But 
the majority of the time I was late because I couldn't get there until 1030 just based on the realities of where I lived. And they wouldn't change my shift. They wanted me there at 10 o'clock and they just refused to accommodate that. So it became this ongoing friction. I didn't want to be late. And in fact, I, I often did work ahead of time and after work really to offset being half an hour late. And that actually ended up contributing to burnout in that accident I mentioned. How do you adjust that? Now, I had a component where I actually had to be logged into the phone system for five hours a day. So out of eight hours that I worked, I had to be logged into the phone system for five days, five hours a day. Now, I could have chosen, if I had time flexibility, to really get up at 5 o'clock, work until 7 o'clock. That gave me two hours where I could actually do work that was asynchronous, that didn't actually involve anybody else, didn't involve being available at a time that other people were. And I could get focus work done. And then I could drop my kids off and race to the office and get there in time whenever I got there. There was not necessarily that hard stop of, I have to log in by exactly 10 a.m. And that way, it would have been a lot less stressful. Again, I could have come in. I could have chosen whether I actually logged in the phone immediately or did that one other hour of focus work and then log in for the phones for the five hours that I was required to do. Or I could have done it completely different. I could have done no work in the morning. I could have dropped my kids off, gone into the office, got there whenever I did log into the phone for five hours, and then do the focus work at the end of the day. Log out at three o'clock and do all the focus work, make sure that I could get everything done for from three until six in the drive home. And I bounced between the two, to be honest. I didn't necessarily have permission to do what I did, but I did it. What does that look like if you're using that time flexibility, especially when you're actually in a situation where people are moving and have moved during the pandemic to locations that they didn't ever anticipate they were going to have to commute from. So I know people who moved out and their commute is actually three hours one way to get into where their office has always been located. That's not reasonable. Three hours one way, that's a six-hour commute in one day. That's, that's beyond reasonable, right? How do you work with those people? What's reasonable? And how do you make sure that all of this is equitable, right? Because you might have people who work around the corner and you might have people who have moved. So what does that look like and what choices are you going to make for those people and those realities? So those are all the things that you have to consider with a hybrid plan. And this is really where you need to bring in somebody specific that's going to look at everything that's happening within the company and have an assessment of how the whole system works. And we're talking all of the systems. We're talking leadership. We're talking management. We're talking HR. We're talking benefits and rewards and recognition. And it's just how everything works together. And it's important to have either a consultant who's brought in to facilitate that project who has fairly holistic access, or you actually look at hiring somebody internally to be responsible for everything, who's going to audit the current state, who's going to nurture it on an ongoing basis and facilitate the change management and really advocate for the vision that you've created. So that's what I'd like to say about hybrid work. And I will record another episode about remote work. Thanks for joining me. And this is what we're doing to promote and facilitate hybrid remote excellence. The Hybrid Remote Center of Excellence really is about creating the future of work that's going to help people and the work thrive. So we're going to co-create that together. And that's the purpose of what we're creating with this podcast. So thanks for joining me. I'm Nola Simon. 